I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekrastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Hello and welcome to the MacGuffin Podcast, episode 63. Senior discount? I think we can get it now. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm John. I'm Spencer. And uh once again, we are doing Horror at the MacGuffin all October long. Woo! <laughs> we are going to scare the crap out of you. And we are going to do that by listing our top five horror movies of all time. Spencer and I will each give our separate lists. <laughs> yeah, we're going to exactly. reenact them all. <laughs> it's going to be a, what would that be, 20-hour podcast <laughs> reenacting yeah. all the movies. Uh, then we're going to follow that up with a talk about fan-made documentaries, which has been something that's been happening in mainly the horror community mm -hmm. for a few years now. Stuff like Never Sleep Again and uh, The Psycho Legacy, where fans take it upon themselves to look back on their favorite movies and make a big production and interview the people who made their favorite movies. Good times. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to wrap that all up with some DVD picks. As usual. Yeah, some nice stuff this week. And uh, you can find all of our contact info and reviews, exclusive web content, uh, all at MacGuffinPodcast.com. It's the place to be. And if you are not there besides the time you're watching it, you should be. Exactly. And we should also mention, to go along with this Horror Fest and our top five list today, on the MacGuffinPodcast.com all October long, our writers are counting down what we collectively voted the top 31 horror movies of all time. Yeah. So you, you can see, do our movies end up on that list? Yeah, you're going to have some catching up to do. Mm-hmm. So get on that. Yeah. Horror movies. I love them. I love them too. That's, that's an amazing <laughs> coincidence. What are the possibilities? Who are you? I'm John. I, I'm Spencer. It's great. It's great. Yeah, we should talk about we some horror, horror movies. movies. Yeah. What would you say are your top five horror movies of all time? Spencer? Oh my god, that's so awesome that you talked about that just because it just occurred to me what they are. Really? What do you say we count them down in order from least favorite to favorite? Right now? Right now. Oh my god, this is so awesome. I can't wait. <laughs> all right. So, Spencer, your number five horror film of all time. Uh, for my number five, I picked a film that. I know there's probably going to be a fair amount of debate about, mm. but I think it achieves a lot of great things, and that is Paranormal Activity. Mm. I find Paranormal Activity to be the best of that sort of uh, handy cam, uh, quasi-real... Like found uh, footage yeah, sort so of movies. I, think, I, mean, yeah. Blair, I like Blair Witch, I like all that kind of stuff, but Paranormal acti Activity is one of the scariest films for the least amount of money, I, I mean, probably ever. Oh, yeah, I definitely. Mean, what they pulled off for $15,000... Was incredible. And it just shows you, you what you don't see can be just as scary as what you do see. Now, I definitely don't agree it should be a top five movie for me. Um, I think it is very scary, although as a movie, it's good. But I, mean, I don't think it's, you know, that great thing that would put it into my top five. I, I personally think that some of probably what some people consider its faults are actually um, some of its strengths. For instance, like, I think the fact that they didn't get super sucked into the backstory of what this is and all that, mm -hmm. I think I think keeping it ambiguous oh, is yeah. a great thing. I think mm -hmm. the couple who, not the couple, the couple in the movie. Yeah, the actors. Uh, the actors were... Really good. I thought. I mean, I, I thought, thought they were, they were extremely totally believable. Solid, yeah. I mean, I th I think you know um, the concept really interesting. I love ghosts. Mm -hmm. Ghosts are one of my favorite um, things, and you probably will see some coming back <laughs> later on this list. Um, I just I just think it's a really fun, scary. I think it's probably one of the scariest films I've ever seen. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. It is that weird thing where it's like it scared the crap out of me, but overall, as a movie, really good, but not great. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we're going to have to disagree about that. Yeah, we'll have to agree to disagree. Yes. <laughs> uh, my number five movie is from the Nature Gone Amuck genre. It arguably kick-started that into high gear, and that was Steven Spielberg's Jaws. Oh, you're, I thought you were going to say, like, Placid. 
<laughs> no, no, no. Um, and it's so interesting to think about Steven Spielberg as this great horror director, but I mean, man, even something in like Close Encounters, the scene where the kid's running around the house and he's going to be abducted, that's horrifying. This guy yeah. who is known as like the blockbuster sappy man is a great horror director, and Jaws is absolutely terrifying. I think it's got great performances by everyone involved. Roy Scheider, I don't think, was ever better. Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfus. I mean, these guys have had amazing careers, but for me, it's just those characters in Jaws or what pops in my head when I think of them. You know, I, I love Jaws, and I, I mean, I can't really criticize heavy on this list because it's an amazing film. Mm -hmm. The only problem for me was the best parts of Jaws were when the shark wasn't on camera. And ultimately, mm -hmm. you have to go to that crescendo of the shark coming on camera, and that sort of just doesn't carry through it. So you mean the attack scenes themselves were the least interesting part or the, the just... one at the end okay you didn't like the way the shark looked yeah i mean i'm fine with the shark i mean i i, I mean i'm sorry you're saying something that ruined the movie for mm. me but i'm saying the best parts were the parts where you couldn't really see what was occurring you just saw like bits and pieces and... oh no and i think that's one of the great things about the movie much like paranormal activity what you didn't see in jaws right. made it even more scary if right. you saw the shark the whole time you know what would it be it'd be like placid where they showed the alligator but or whatever my, my only time. point is that ultimately the climax mm. is is seeing the shark and that's sort of unfortunate if there were some way i mean you had to do it yeah but if there's some way you could avoid doing it i think it would have been just a little better yeah i guess so i'm fine seeing the shark um and of course you get that great great scene where brody's I mean, like you know smiley you, son you, of a bitch you, ha you have to you have to do it i mean you can't yeah. you can't <laughs> you can't build up to something and then never show it mm -hmm. um at least not if it's not a ghost i guess yeah um but it, it i i think i think the build-up is amazing mm -hmm. like when they are trying to figure out what this thing is, where it is, how big it is, all that kind of stuff, I think, is amazing. Exactly, and it's something that you just, every nature gone amok movie afterwards would rip off everything about it. Yeah. You know, not revealing the monster for a long time, the point of view of the monster, the mayor who doesn't want to close the town or whatever, you know. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it, as you said, it's, it's Steven Spielberg, the schmaltiest director <laughs> in Hollywood, doing something that, I mean... Made him famous, basically. Yeah, it made him famous, and it shows a kid being eaten by a shark. Yeah. I mean, imagine that. Yeah. The guy who showed Indiana Jones getting married and ruining the franchise had a kid getting eaten by a shark. Yeah. <laughs> How far the time can take you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what was your number four, Spencer? My number four is another uh, fairly recent film, one that we've discussed on several occasions, uh, The Descent. Great film. By Neil Marshall. Mm -hmm. um, the Descent is one of those films that... Um, I love the claustrophobic aspects of it, you know, much like, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, any of the zombie films we've talked over time mm -hmm. or or uh, Assault the Precinct 13 or that kind of film. It's it's a group of women who go spelunking, yeah. looking for good times. Does they not, find horrible monsters. Yeah, it does not pan out <laughs> that way. And unlike other films like The Cave, which tackle the same basic premise, mm. um, this one, again, sort of implies that less is more. Mm. Um where you see bits and pieces for it, um, and it's great. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a movie that is scary before the monsters show up. How many movies can say that? Like them yeah. crawling through the rocks and there might be a cave in, stuff like that is horrifying. And that's before any monsters show well, up, I mean, before any blood is spilled. Again, <laughs> both this and paranormal activity sort of buy into this things that, like, I think the stuff that is the most plausible is sometimes the most scary. Like, mm. you know, uh, this. I could go spelunking. Yeah. Man, I don't know if I'd run into like creatures. Yeah. But I but can't I would say, say definitively if that's I. That's true. <laughs> I would say you know running into creatures is more likely than running into a werewolf or vampire. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, like, exactly. Sa same with you know like uh, I can't say that ghosts do or do not exist. I mean, there seems to be a lot of anecdotal evidence. So, mm -hmm. Just I mean, like maybe cave monsters. But I don't know anybody who's actually <laughs> run into a werewolf. I mean, <laughs> so I mean these are these are things that I foresee theoretically could happen to me mm -hmm. and i find that to be very scary yeah i mean i am all about the descent it's my favorite modern horror movie um of the you know kind of there was a little resurgence in the 2000s mm -hmm. of solid yeah. horror movies and the descent i think sat at the top and yeah just all around good it makes kind of wish neil marshall would get back to horror because now he's he's doing action he's kind of doing the john carpenter route going into some action hopefully he gets back to some horror sometime soon i, I got faith i don't know, just amazing film mm-hmm uh, well, my number four is The Thing, speaking of John Carpenter, the 1982 mm. version. And this is such a great movie. As far as, like, you want to talk about isolation, yeah. it's these 12 guys are just on an outpost in Antarctica. 
and there's nothing around but ice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 again, one of those things that you're not going to get help. Like, don't even, don't, can don't, even, don't even think about help because there's no possible way mm -hmm. you could get help. And, you know, in the midst of these guys is a shape-shifting alien, one of whom... Or it can make itself look like the guys, and one of them or more might be the thing, and they have to I figure mean, out who to trust, who not to trust. And I mean, you hear the premise, and yeah, maybe it sounds a little cheesy, mm. a shape-shifting alien. Who's, it's 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 basically it boils down to the same concept as you know, like uh, Ten Little Indians or any of those Agatha Christie yeah. type things. It's like one of these people's a killer. Which ones are going to be, mm -hmm. and it is very suspenseful in figuring yeah. out who it is. Oh, and that definitely. that is the core of it to me is the suspense, and you don't know who the killer is, regardless of it's alien or not. Mm -hmm. That really brings it all together. The alien thing just adds some cool gore and stuff. Oh, like definitely. That. And I am a big fan of gore. I like the suspense buildup. I also like the gore. So this has the nice buildup with the gory payoff, and the effects by Rob Bottin are amazing. Yep, still um, stand up. 30 years later. Exactly. And there are just some scenes in that movie that just horrify me to no end. <laughs> I mean, you got to talk about some great uh, performances. I mean, Kurt Russell, mm -hmm. amazing. Frequently, I mean, people forget about this when they talk about him. Talk about, you know, Snake. Talk about maybe Backdraft or mm -hmm. any number of other things. But sadly, the thing overlooked. That's true. His performance is R.J. McCready, a guy who doesn't want to be the hero. He doesn't want to be in charge. But circumstances force him to, you know, take that mantle. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it's just a great movie. And it's not afraid to, you know, shock you, whether it be with gore effects or, you know, the killing characters you don't expect to. Maybe not wrapping everything up in a nice tiny little bow. So, yeah, there's a thing for you. All right. Well, my number three certainly probably will cause controversy, but I'm sticking by it. I love the film. It holds up for me, and that is Gremlins. Hmm. Um, perhaps not what most people think of when they think of horror films or whatever. I think Gremlins is sort of one of those quintessential um, changing to a monster kind of movies for mm. me. Like, the original and the sequel are very different films, granted. Yeah. But the original, like, starts out nice, kid gets a nice little cute pet. <laughs> Turns out the, ki the cute pet basically is like a demon when <laughs> you give it, like, water, food, and all that other yeah, stuff. Yeah, the rules that they came up with. Like, the Grem the Mogwai, the Gremlins are, like, some of the most original creations ever. Yeah. I mean, Chris Columbus's script is very interesting yeah. in that it is kind of like, starts off nice Americana, and then it goes really dark, and, I mean, people are killed in gruesome ways. The movie inspired the PG-13 rating because parents yeah. were so outraged. I mean, and, you know, Joe Dante... <laughs> Yeah, great director. director. Yeah, so he, he deserves an immense amount of credit. There is some sort of, a nice sort of line between fun and horrific in the film where mm -hmm. the Gremlins are both like evil, but you look at what they do when they're sort of out in the world as these yeah. creatures. Yeah, it makes me think of like the bar scene, just yeah. Gremlins being ridiculous and having fun. Yeah. The whole like flash dance Gremlin that shows yeah. up and it's like da, 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 yeah. the legs moving, I just crack up yeah, uncontrollably it's, it's every great. time I see it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of other interesting aspects like the whole holiday sort of spin to the movie. Oh yeah, exactly. One of the best horror movies set on Christmas. Yeah. So I mean, it just, it's a, it is a fun entertaining film mm -hmm. and i just i like i like the the monster changing aspect of it yeah. that sort of is what kicks into the next gear because mm -hmm. it sort of puts this guy who was completely unprepared again to be a hero has to deal with these little demons going yeah. all over town taking over the town and, <laughs> and it inspired a whole subgenre throughout the 80s you got the munchies you got the ghoulies yeah. even like killer dolls came back after gremlins yeah. made little things yeah. popular and i mean i like the sequel but the original holds yeah. a special place in my heart yeah i definitely it wouldn't be in my top five or even ten horror movies but i i love gremlins i'm not gonna argue with you on that one uh my number three movie is halloween from 1978 once again directed by john carpenter who i'm gonna throw out there the best horror director Ooh, that's tough i don't know wes craven's in that conversation too. but i mean i don't know about you i don't have any wes craven movies in my top five i have two uh, john carpenter fair enough i don't have any i don't have any uh john Car or, yeah, i don't have any wes craven in my top five so. um so for me at least my favorite of all the horror directors is he, john carpenter. he's definitely i mean in the top like handful at the very mm -hmm. least without question and uh halloween was a movie that put him on the map the most successful independent movie of all time when it came out in the 70s and held that record for uh, about I 12 mean, years it made 47 million dollars in 1978 
And they only, it only yeah. costs 320,000 320, to make. Exactly. And that was the days when movie tickets cost two bucks, you know? It's, yeah, it's, it's that much. <laughs> so a monumental achievement. Like all these other ones, it spawned so much. All of, Pretty much every horror movie made in the 80s was a slasher movie. And Halloween, you know, wasn't the first. You know, Black Christmas came before. You could argue Psycho before it. But it made it popular. And there are yeah, so many no, great I, aspects. I, mean, I think of Psycho, or sorry, Halloween, Halloween. <laughs> as the quintessential slasher film. Mm. Like, I mean... You can you can argue any number of ones sort of are in the same one and did it before same genre and did it before it, but the immediate impact of yeah. Halloween is where I think it clearly shows it to be the quintessential one. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at like uh, Friday the Thirteenth was like popping up right after Oh, exactly. Halloween Even the, you know, Sean Cunningham has said the impetus for Friday the 13th was he saw Halloween and he told his writer, Victor Miller, rip that off. And that was Friday the 13th. Yeah. I mean, they came up with a good ripoff, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> uh, I, I love I love Halloween. I think, I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis started her career there, which is great. Yeah, Donald Pleasance as Dr. Loomis, I would say, in his very illustrious career, that's my favorite of all of his characters. And he came back throughout the sequels. I mean, the only problem with that is the sequels. That's the only flaw <laughs> against Halloween is that they really drag that series through the mud. Mm-hmm. I feel like that is one of the series that had the least amount of growth. I mean, as weird as it is to sound, <laughs> like even Friday the 13th had more growth. It kind of had more going on. You're right about that. So, um, it, 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 and you can't fault the original no. for that, but <laughs> the original is a great film. That's all you got to say. Yeah, about that. definitely. And just it's since been sequeled to death, remade to death. None of them even came close to the original. And I like some of the Halloween sequels, but the original is where it's at as far as slasher movies and as far as John Carpenter movies for me personally. Yeah, it's a good selection. Um, My number two, I'm going to be the first one we got both of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And that's the thing for me. Oh, good choice. I like that movie. It's a great film. Um, (laughs) Again, you know, the claustrophobic aspects of it, Mm. Um, the uh, questions of who is the killer. I think that is one of the the things that I find most suspenseful is there. I mean, sometimes, you know, with like um, aliens or something like that, it's something out of left field. You don't know what it is. It's killing stuff. Mm. But it's, it's just like an alien. I couldn't have possibly known what this is. Ignoring the fact that this is a space shape-shifting alien thing or whatever mm-hmm. um it's you know it's going to be one of these 12 people yeah i mean regardless of what shape it's in it's one of these 12 people and though that's all it can be so you look around the room and one of those other people is killing yeah and so <laughs> I, I, it's su- a, such a, a suspenseful premise oh yeah I like. I also got. You got to appreciate the setting it in Antarctica. It's great. The whole you know snow is very conducive to horror. I think we'll see later on in our lists. You know, yeah, just the winter so. setting, or it just makes you feel so trapped. I well, mean, I mean cities well, that's, shut down well, when it snows. I mean, at least Seattle. Well, that's <laughs> just it. Like, a, they're in such a remote location mm-hmm. that they can't expect help to come to them. And b. Even if they wanted to flee, they die. Like they can't. Yeah. You can't go out in Antarctica and like live. Like you're dead. <laughs> and there's like, nowhere for you to go. Yeah. And a storm has come in. We have to mention so they cannot fly out right away. So that so that <laughs> is the ultimate sort of trapped in one place. Mm-hmm. I mean, probably of all movies, I can't oh, yeah. think of any movie that is, feels even more trapped in one spot. No, definitely the best. That claustrophobic. Who can you trust? And I would say, uh, alien horror. I prefer the thing even to the Alien series. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I I I, agree, I would agree with that. Alien is a very good horror film as well, but yeah, this one, Al- Alien, there's the whole just be just being stalked mm-hmm. by something. You don't, I mean, you know, it's some sort of creature, but you don't know what it is. This, I mean, you're you're looking at all the other people, and one of them is yeah. killing you. You know, your killer. It'd basically. be like if right now my head split open and bit into your yes. head. If you were I'm like, the thing. if you, if you well, or if it, you mean I'm just comparing, it, it, like if you were the alien, it'd be like you were the actual alien sitting next to me, and I'm like, so what's up? And you're like, yeah, one of one of us is a killer. Yeah. You know which one it is? I don't know. <laughs> so we'll just have to uh, podcast and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> to paraphrase the ending of the movie. Exactly. So <laughs> it, it, it's it's an amazing thing. I think the cast they got was great. Mm-hmm. John Carpenter did a wonderful job uh as we spoke of before the effects held up 30 years later yeah, they're like, so good some of the best practical makeup effects that you will ever see it's up there with something like an american world in london or the howling and that is one thing that generally is a fault of horror films is cheesy 
effects. Yeah, they don't so. have the budget for it, or what at the time they could do doesn't look good later on. So the fact that it was able to achieve this, mm -hmm. bueno, muy bueno. <laughs> we like, we like. Yeah, it's good, it's good, it's very, very good. So uh, my number two movie is The Return of the Living Dead from 1985. This is my favorite zombie movie of all time, and I also think it's one of the most fun movies. I can sit down and watch Return of the Living Dead and have multiple times during a day. It's just a blast. Dan O'Bannon, one of the only movies he directed, he was famously the writer of Alien and Total Recall, um, just delivers this just adrenaline rush of a movie. I mean, it's zombie versus punk rockers in a cemetery and he kind of reinvents the whole idea of what a zombie is I mean people give 28 days later all this credit for the running zombies people Return of Living Dead did it 20 years before that running zombies yeah. they talked uh, they had hair they um, you know if you hit them in the head they didn't die you could not kill these zombies it's just unrelenting but at the same time it's funny and scary all wrapped up at the same time you'll find yourself just laughing as hordes of zombies just come out of nowhere and attack somebody but then once it gets into like the kill scene you're like oh my god like it's revolting I mean there I mean there's clearly it's definitely an influence on other films I mean obviously Shaun of the Dead mm. uh, Zombieland you can see yeah. sort of the influence on those good films I, I agree I think it's a very good film it's not that high for me mm. I mean it's definitely I, I think it was on my list of 31 it was somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. um, I I personally don't really love zombie films in general. I, mm. I mean, I, I, I appreciate somewhat of the horror, but... Uh, I think they're kind of overplayed. I'll agree with you on that. They're, they're kind of overplayed, and uh, I just I can't embrace that idea as much as these other ones. Like, you know, like, things that could actually occur to me, I find, to be more scary. Mm. Things that are, like, isolation and being trapped and all that kind of stuff, I find to be scarier. I mean, I, I, I think they're fun films. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't love them as much. Mm. I mean, th as I said, they're on my list, though. Clearly. Yeah. <laughs> they're, it's, and, and you're right. It's It's... Unfortunate in a lot of ways that uh, Return of the Living Dead doesn't get the uh, credit it probably deserves because mm. other things like 28 Days Later, everybody yeah. thinks of when they think of zombie film. Exactly. So if if you're really gonna give zombie films the true credit they deserve, you gotta go look back, and this is mm -hmm. sort of a good place to. Uh, begin that. Yeah, definitely. And also, uh, one of my favorite uh, film soundtracks in Return of the Living Dead, a lot of great 80s punk artists uh, singing about zombies. That's pretty cool. <laughs> How often can you say a band does that? Yeah. <laughs> it's cool. Uh, all right. Well, that brings me to my number one. Ooh. Yeah. Um, Drum and, roll. <laughs> uh, and if you've been listening to the list, you might be able to guess what my number one is, and that is The Shining. Um, Stanley Kubrick? Stanley Kubrick, uh, based on a Stephen King novel, mm -hmm. um, though it's loosely based yeah. <laughs> on it. Uh, you know, it, the, the Shining is basically, to me, uh, like The Thing, but even less people mm. and, like, just as much, like, lack of hope. Mm. Um, but it sort of grows the sort of mythos. And it isn't just one person that's killing them it's it's basically an an evil entity yeah. in the hotel so it combines sort of like the isolation with like ghosts mm -hmm. so are two of my favorite things in one sort of <laughs> film um i find the hotel uh in the shining to be tremendously creepy mm -hmm. like I, I i i i it's even even watching this film this film came out 30 years ago and yeah. even looking at it today like the the little girls the elevator of blood the the, <laughs> the little girls in the hallway is one of the creepiest was it like of three, on film. room 307 or whatever it is he goes into with that creepy woman and stuff in the tub yeah, yeah it's awful <laughs> like um and it it's 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 uber um it it builds really well to that end as you watch him increasingly mm. grow crazy and it's sort of like the thing except you know which one yeah. is going to kill you you're watching them get agitated and there's like virtually nothing you can do about it mm -hmm. and it, it it it's amazing i mean um the the sort of claustrophobic um family drama that unfolds in this environment is is really amazing and i think the the ending that it builds to is a, a great climax i think mm. the ending of it is one of the best parts now this is the part where i always kind of like get into shit with some uh, other horror fans I mean, I, and uh that's where i'm gonna say i don't dislike the shining but i think it might be the most overrated horror movie out there 
Oh, I think I think their other films are probably more overrated. I don't I, every pretty much every horror list I see, number one or two is The Shining, and I it wasn't even in my top thirty one when I did the list wow. uh, <laughs> for our website. Uh, maybe that's just because you don't have good taste. <laughs> it might be. I don't know. I def I like the movie. Um, it does get better the more I watch it. I've liked it much less in the past than I do at this moment. But for me, I think it's I'm such a fan of Stephen King's book, and I think the things that worked really well in the book, they failed in the movie. Like the whole point of the book, I thought was it was about this loving father slowly losing his humanity and in the shining jack nicholson is crazy from frame one you see him and the dude is messed up well, like I there's mean, no progression i i, I think you're kind of undercutting it a little bit i mean he he has problems agreed but he also um the part of the whole reason they're doing this is so that he can sort of get back to being a good father and all this other stuff. That's part mm. of the reason why they go to this hotel. But when they go, he's obviously kind of unhinged, just the way that Jack presents himself and the way he acts in the movie, just the way he chose to give that performance. In The Shining book, there had been, you know, he'd had some problems in the past, but at that moment, he was at the best he had been in years, and then you slowly see this devolution into going back to his bad ways and worse. I mean, I, I, And that I, was something that I think Kubrick didn't really he wasn't really interested in even getting uh, across in the movie and that's a know. problem that King I, had I feel like it did come across um, I mean I, they've made other adaptations like they made one for TV with Stephen, which Stephen King wrote yeah. which was much more uh, authentic to the original book I believe yeah it was closer to the but, book the problem it had was that Kubrick wasn't directing it and some of the things that Kubrick added like this a lot of the scare ideas that weren't in the book stuff like the maze or you know some of the imagery that he came up with I think was what was lacking well, in I, that I, I, I just also think that like the things that were scary were done better by Kubrick. Mm. I mean, even the things that were the same, you know, like the elevator, the evil girls, all that stuff. Like, I, I personally prefer the Kubrick version. Oh, even, I would even, say I prefer it too. I just even, even out though, of all of them, the novel is where I would go for The Shining. Meh, I mean, maybe maybe it's not as authentic, um, but I, I think it. I, I I think it's an amazing sort of uh, claustrophobic atmosphere and I I still f find hotels somewhat creepy because of that <laughs> film so all right well uh, my number one movie um, can you do the drum roll I can't do it <laughs> is 1981's An American Werewolf in London mm. which was directed by John Landis uh, up to that point known as a comedy director and uh, what he was able to do with American Werewolf in London was really give you a lot of great character development before the horror happens, and he did that through his great understanding of comedy. Mm. I mean, there's just funny scenes between David Naughton and Griffin Dunn, and you just come to really know these characters, and then this horrific thing happens, and the horror is really scary. Mm. Like, it's not one of these horror comedies where the whole time is kind of played tongue-in-cheek. I mean, the scene where they're out on the moors and the wolf is circling them is horrifying. Yeah. And then there's some amazing makeup effects. I mean, they created the Oscar for Best Makeup Effects for an American World from London. Yeah. It was in competition you know every year after that and it's amazing the world transformation even just the gore effects of the friend jack coming back from the dead to warn david what's going to happen to him and he's slowly decomposing more and more every time mm. he shows up i just i totally love it werewolves are my favorite movie monsters and the movie is just so much fun, but it's also a tragedy. I mean, it's one of the only movies where I can laugh hysterically and get really upset at the characters I love being <clears throat> killed. And I mean, John Landis didn't really go back much to the horror genre. Yeah. He always had more of a comedic bent, like or things like Michael Jackson's Thriller. He also did Innocent Blood, much more had comedy going on to it. But I think the guy is a solid horror director. And I mean, this one movie just shows it. was it. solid. I, again, it's much like... Uh... No, uh, Return of the Living Dead. I, I, I like it a lot, but it's not as high on my list. Mm. I mean, part of it probably boils down to the fact that I don't love werewolves as much as you do. Mm. Like, I find them to be one of the lesser things, and usually that's because they're done so poorly. I mean, this, yeah, there's the, a lot of bad werewolves. This, 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 maybe. Do, this does it probably amongst the best, but mm -hmm. even that, I'm still not blown away by. I mean, mm. it just, it never sort of goes the places. I would want a werewolf movie to go. And I mean, that's 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 tough to do. <laughs> Where um, would you want it to go besides a dude turns into a werewolf and eats people? But I mean, just like <laughs> the, the effects and stuff like mm. that. I mean, it does it does very solid effects given the time and all that stuff. Even still, they're pretty good. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like, 
it, it, it gives you the bits of it, but you don't really get like full on werewolf experience. And that's sort of what I would like to see. You know, I feel like something like an underworld type movie where werewolves are like, when the, the, I'm not saying that under, the werewolves in Underworld are better. I'm just saying like... So you want them to be hairless and look like panthers? I, I just, I want more <laughs> perspective of that sort of werewolf experience. You know, like, like something like Wolf. Like, where you, it's it's not, it's, it's you, you experience the guy sort of going through the process of becoming a Have werewolf. Have you seen an American World in London recently? Yes. You're describing what the movie is. <laughs> yes, but I, I, I'm, I'm just, I, I want... Uh, maybe I'm not explaining it itself well. I, j I, j I, I like I like it does a lot of the sort of presenting it, but I, I just want more of the experience, more of the sort of to me, uh, it's sort of like becoming a vampire, you know. Hmm. Um, and it, yes, it, it, there is a lot of that, but there's a lot more of the side characters and all that kind of stuff. But. Yeah, I think. I don't know. This is an argument you're not. I, I can't be convinced on. <laughs> no, I, I know. I know you love the film. I'm not saying. I'm not saying that. It's just. I just. I just. I, for what I imagine, and I probably have not done a good job describing mm. what I want from a werewolf. But it, it, it gets close, as close as any film. Mm. But given that they're sort of fantastical creatures. Yeah. Um. It just. I just. I need more. Is my point. Okay. Yeah. For me, I mean. The only thing missing to me from this movie is a two-legged werewolf. I'm I love werewolves, well, and it's a four-legged werewolf in this movie well, as opposed to the two-legged. That's what variety. I'm saying. You know, you, you, I I want sort of like a let the right one in of werewolves, where you sort of get the full werewolf experience, and and mm. you, I mean you don't get that with this entirely. You get you get you get as close as any most pretty much any film, but you just don't get the whole enchilada. Hmm. I would argue you get the whole enchilada and some horchata to wash it down. So uh, there you have uh, our individual top five lists of the best horror films of all time. Let us know what you think. Uh, were we crazy? Did you understand Spencer's explanation of werewolves? Uh, let us know what you think at MacGuffinPodcast.com. And you can also find the full MacGuffin writing staff list of the top 31 horror movies. Some of our movies, do they appear on it? Are they as high as we put it? Who knows? You'll have to look and find, find out. out. Yeah. Stay tuned. So now we are talking fan-made documentaries. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something where, you know, maybe the studios didn't treat movies with enough respect in their DVD release. Maybe someone just loves a movie so much they want to know everything about it. And so they take it upon themselves to get a crew together and start contacting the actors and the behind-the-scenes people. And they make their own documentary. Sometimes these are picked up by studios and put on a DVD or Blu-ray re-release. Sometimes they're released by themselves. But it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. It's just started uh, sort of recently. Recently. Uh, looking back, the first one yeah. I can think of was about four years ago, and that was Halloween 25 Years of Terror. And uh, a lot, some of the people that made it would go on to work on a couple of more fan documentaries. Uh, the director, um, oh, Stephen sorry, the, Hutchinson. one of the producers the writers, was uh, yeah, the Daniel Ferens, and oh. he would go on to work on some, some of these other big documentaries. Well, also, also uh, Anthony Massey, mm. the one. And uh, with Halloween, 25 Years of Terror, what it was was there was a big Halloween convention, and they went out there and just filmed all the actors who were appearing, the directors and the writers who were appearing, and just got stories of each of the movies. Now, granted, it's not as in-depth as something like the original Halloween, where you're going to get big documentaries just for that movie, but... With 25 Years of Terror, you're going to find the best information on Part 2 and Part 3, which have no bonus features on their DVD. Um, and kind of, it got the ball rolling in the fact that it was bought by Anchor Bay and released as its own special DVD with bonus features of, like, extended interviews and panels from the convention. And I think it's a solid product. It kind of, you can tell it's sort of the beta version of the fan-made documentaries and that a lot of big people from the series are missing. People like John Carpenter, Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, that was the thing that sort of bothered me most is that the stuff that the, the key people in the series unfortunately only appear through archival footage mm. I mean granted it's, it's as you said a beta sort of example but I would have liked to have heard yeah. them actually. and also just the fact that it's all about this convention like every background is yeah. just somebody against the wall of the convention yeah. but it is interesting it's definitely worth picking up and it got the ball rolling I, I mean I think you gotta also consider the uh, rise of digital video as mm. part of this because the easier and more accessible everyone getting a camera is the more that's this true. stuff seems yeah. to have picked up so that's gotta be 
considered. And, and then a big one that came out soon after that is uh, The Shark is Still Working, which is about Jaws. And this movie I have been hearing about for years, and it still hasn't been officially released. It's played at a number of festivals. Spielberg has said it's great. People like Kevin Smith have said it's great. But for whatever reason, it has not come out. And I'm trying to think if Jaws has been announced for Blu-ray or not yet, but th that's got to be the perfect opportunity yeah, for it to come out. Great. I really hope the Universal would, Here's you know, know take the opportunity to buy the rights and put include it on there because I mean Jaws already has a great documentary um, on the DVD back from the Laserdisc days but I think with the shark is still working what they do is they get a lot of the fans who later became famous people like Brian Singer or Kevin Smith who say that Jaws is among their favorite movies of oh, all time. Oh yeah totally influential I mean mm -hmm. we just spoke of how awesome it was yeah. a moment ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah then soon after that uh, we had Beware the Moon which was the story of an American werewolf in London obviously I'm a big fan of this yes. documentary. Um, and this was one, it was directed by Paul Davis, who was a writer for Horror Hound, and it was a success story in that it was purchased by Universal, and it came out on the Blu-ray and DVD re-release of An American Werewolf in London. Which is great. Yeah, which is kind of, you know, it, them, these documentaries getting out there is the big thing. Like, obviously, fans can try to release it on their own, but unless another big company buys it, it, the, it getting out there to the big masses is yeah, kind of hard. Yeah, uh, a lot of them live on sort of that festival circuit and stuff like mm -hmm. that otherwise. I mean, getting the rights to footage and all that stuff can sometimes be difficult so it's 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 clearly a passion project for mm -hmm. all these people exactly and be aware of the moon it just gets all this great information about american werewolf that you can't really get anywhere else um another one outside of the horror genre which recently became kind of a big deal was don't you forget about me john with john hughes exactly it was a kind of a story not just about the movies of john hughes and interviews with the actors and fans but also it was a story of the filmmakers traveling to go try to get an interview with john hughes it was filmed obviously before he died unfortunately he didn't give them an interview and also unfortunately some of the filmmakers are kind of annoying so that sort of distract detracts yeah from the i movie. mean it's, it's tough to not get a uh, interview with sort of the key person involved in all this project. I mean, he's a very, very secretive individual. Mm -hmm. But they did get interviews with a lot of the people in his films. You know, they got uh, Judd Nelson, Judd Nelson there. Andrew McCarthy, Ali Sheedy, all those people. They got people like Kevin Smith. Mm -hmm. They got Jason Reitman. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they got they got a really good selection of people. I just wish they'd gotten that uh, John Hughes one. That would have yeah, put it over the top. Exactly. And then once he passed, um, they were able to sell it, and it's played, I believe, on Stars, and you can find it on DVD. Right. Um, and then now we're getting into an area where like some smaller ventures are coming out and fans are seeing that like, oh, these, these movies are really working. Maybe I'm just going to make it myself as well. And that inspired things like Autopsy of the Dead, which is a movie made about Night of the Living Dead, another movie which has been written about over and over again, but kind of the comprehensive story mm. hasn't totally been told and they have interviews with a bunch of cast members and crew members um, this is one of the ones where they are going with a smaller distribution route so I don't know how far it'll get out there but for the fans of Night of the Living Dead it's definitely worth checking out probably find some unseen stories on there from some of the smaller people involved with yeah. the crew and uh, then we come to, I think, which what is at this point the crown jewel, the king of the fan docs, and that is Never Sleep Again. Yeah, I mean, was it four hours or something? It's a four-hour documentary about all eight Elm Street movies. The remake is not included and should not be. And they interview everybody. <laughs> they interview over 100 people like involved everybody with the series. you want. <laughs> they got mm -hmm. except for some of the bigger names who couldn't be bothered people like Johnny Depp and Patricia Arquette but, but I, mean, I mean all the directors are there the writers all of the all the really know, supporting important actors. people yeah. you care about are there I mean Heather Langenkamp mm -hmm. Wes Craven yeah and it's just so you can tell the love just the amount of info they get how long it is there's four hours of bonus features and in the bonus features they talk to the guy who drew the posters the guys who did the music mm -hmm. it's like they really go in depth with this and and this is an example where the company is releasing itself, but the product is so good, it's doing great. And we should also mention that we got an interview with Tommy uh, Hudson, who had written the yes. movie, and also Heather Langenkamp. We interviewed them back at Crypticon, and you can find a write-up of that on yeah. our website. Yeah, it was a really interesting conversation. Heather Langenkamp ended up being uh, an executive producer mm -hmm. on this project. So. 
And then uh, that movie being successful, then some of these other smaller ones, which have been around for a couple of years, are now being bought up by some companies. An example of that is the Psycho Legacy, which is coming out next week on DVD from Shout Factory. And this is another one of those instances where Psycho has a great documentary on its DVD, and a lot of people know about Psycho. Books have been written about it, but the sequels, nothing. And so this yeah. movie, you're going to find behind the scenes on the really underrated part two, but also the info on part three, which Anthony Perkins directed, and the made-for-t TV part four. And it has uh, Anthony Massey as one of the producers of it who mm -hmm. worked on the Halloween one. I think he worked on a couple other ones actually. So he's deeply entrenched in the horror world. Mm -hmm. Again, it's one of those things that, you know, you get archival interviews with like Anthony Perkins. And well, because he's of course passed away right. a long time ago. <laughs> right. But like, again, those would have been the ones I would have liked to have mm. really heard from since they're. I think with Psycho, like honestly, the first movie is so well documented that I'm fine with the focus on the sequels. Like, that's what I'm really interested mm. in. Like, Psycho 2, pretty much the special edition of Psycho 2 you're never going to get just buy the Psycho Legacy DVD and that makes it yeah. and since it's being put out by Shout Factory you know it's going to be loaded good. be a nice little I mean, release but these fan docs are popping up all over the place these days uh, I mean it seems like in the last five years at mm -hmm. least 90% of the ones we're talking about yeah. have occurred so it probably only continue to grow exponentially mm -hmm. uh, right now it's primarily focused in horror hopefully I think that'll that's because horror fandom is like the strongest much harder, there yeah, yeah. more hardcore mm -hmm. but hopefully it'll expand into other areas I mean yeah I know there are plenty of movies that I love that don't have big special edition DVDs yeah. like the studios don't want to invest the money or the time and it, maybe it's up to the fans if you want your favorite movie to know the story of it maybe you just have to do it yourself yeah shows you that it can be done mm -hmm. so exactly go out and do it yeah we'll probably watch it <laughs> definitely and uh, let us know what you think about these documentaries if there's any coming up that we haven't heard of yet uh, mcguffinpodcast.com it's the place with all the good stuff so here we are once again DVD picks of the week for October 12th it's a good day and uh, I'm sticking with the horror theme of today's episode are you? no I'm going with a much more upbeat sort of theme um <laughs> My pick for the week is How to Train Your Dragon. <laughs> I've spoken about it. It's I, actually been your DVD pick before when it wasn't even on DVD. Was it really? Yeah. Oh, it was my anti-DVD <laughs> pick, was it? Yeah, well, this is my actual DVD pick this time. Um, the great film. I love, I love animated films. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is the first one from DreamWorks that really blew me away. I, I, I like Kung Fu Panda, but not nearly as much as WALL-E. And this is the first time like I feel like they've really given uh, Pixar a run for their money. Really? Yeah, it's very interesting. Just all the love I've heard online and from you about it makes me very interested in checking it out. I unfortunately haven't yet, but I'll be renting it on yeah, the 12th. It's, it's great. Great DVD. They have a, a new adventure. Uh, a lot of those animated movies have that. They feel like they can't put it out on home video without a short to go with well, it. Well, you know, I, I'm not going to shoot it down. They got storyboards. They got pop-up trivia, deleted scenes, inspiration of the characters, uh, build your own 3D dragons, That's DVD, cool. uh, <laughs> filmmaker commentary, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, great film, great DVD. Check it out. I highly recommend it. Um, and as I said before, I'm going more the horror route, also the classic route, with the Blu-ray release of Magic. This is a movie from 1978, and it's a killer doll movie, but it's like the Shakespeare of killer doll movies, just the talent involved. It's directed by Richard Attenborough. It's written by William Goldman. It stars Anthony Hopkins, Anne Margaret, and Burgess Meredith. Like, that is some it's big good. talent yeah, behind it's... a killer doll movie. Yeah. But it's such a good movie. It's it's very psychological. Uh, Anthony Hopkins plays this failing comedian who has a prop dummy named Fats, who, you know, is giving him kind of snide remarks, it's kind a, of egging I mean, him on. It's, it's a ventriloquist dummy. Ventriloquist dummy, yes, yes, yes. And it is just so creepy. And there are some really horrific scenes, but one thing that's great about it is the script always stays true with, like, the human uh, mm -hmm. drama and twists it in ways you wouldn't expect. Like, there's a scene where a guy who kind of has it in for Anthony Hopkins kind of invites him out on a boat. You're like, oh, shit, this is going to end bad. I've seen this scene in a million yeah, movies. And it to father. William Goldman totally twists it into something you, that you wouldn't have expected. Mm -hmm. And the movie's been out on DVD before. It's released by Dark Sky Films, one of our favorite uh, independent DVD companies. This Blu-ray carries over all the bonus features from that, including old interviews with Anthony Hopkins, a uh, new interview with the cinematographer, documentary about fats and dummies like that, which is an extremely creepy. That's yeah, creepy. <laughs> so yeah, definitely something to check out. Uh, those are our picks for October 12th. 
Uh, and you can check out all this and more at MacGuffinPodcast.com. Mm-hmm. And uh, we just want to wrap it up with a couple of quick uh, shout-outs to some events happening this upcoming times. Uh, once again, we are going to be hosting a film screening of Big Trouble in Little China and Night of the Creeps on Friday, October 22nd at the Grand Illusion Cinema. GrandIllusionCinema.org for all that info. And also the short film we made, A Visitor in the Night, is going to be playing at a couple of festivals coming up at the Big Bear Horror Fest on Saturday the 16th in California and it's also going to be playing on California TV stations on Saturday, October 23rd. If you go to visitorinthenight.com you'll get all the exact info on that. And if that isn't enough and it's not coming to where you are, demand it and we'll see what we can do. <laughs> We're hoping for that paranormal activity yeah. kind of numbers. Yeah. We, If they can do it with an hour and a half film, we can do it with a 12 minute film. Why not? Why not? <laughs> see you next time. Delta can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's tight. Don't even try to bite the side of the side. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.